We're back and in our Coping with COVID series, we continue the conversation with Dr. Erica Wheeler, who will talk to us from Monday. We started the conversation on the phase one of the reopening. Welcome, Dr. Erica Wheeler, PAHO WHO country representative for Trinidad and Tobago and the Dutch Kingdom Islands. Good morning. Good morning, Lisa. Thank you very much. Good to be with you again. Always a pleasure. Now, before we jump into talking about which institutions and groups should we pay attention to in terms of opening up, I want us to just dial back to something that appeared overnight in the news about this thing called the Pediatric Inflammatory Multisystem Syndrome, uh, which is appearing now in several countries that is affecting children and uh, from 16 years and younger. And, uh, you know, do you have anything to say on that at all? Well, the what we do have to say is, I know previously um, we noted that COVID-19 uh, was particularly affecting the elderly with underlying diseases, as we know, heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, and so on. Mm -hmm. And we noticed that in the younger age groups, they were not as much affected. We never said, I think we, we had this conversation very briefly before. Yes. We never said that children never got it, but yes. the symptoms appeared to be more mild. Yes. So this appearance of this new inflammatory disease is something that we have to study. And um, as PAHO and WHO, we need to approach this from a scientific perspective. So mm -hmm. although there have been reports of children in different parts of the world, um, it needs to be documented and tracked and there have to be sufficient numbers of children for us to make any definitive statements as to whether this is directly related to mm -hmm. COVID-19 or not. We mm -hmm. don't know as yet. Okay, because some doctors are speculating that since it is coming up out uh, uh, at the peak in these countries, at the peak of COVID-19, then there is perhaps a correlation between this disease and COVID-19. But we wait and see, yeah? Yes. All right, yes. so let's go back to uh, the impact of phase one on the business community. What kind of institutions and groups should the government pay close attention to in light of the opening up of the economy? Well, certainly something we've never touched on before. We need to be looking at personal services as the economy opens, you know, mm -hmm. um, barbershops, hairdressers and so on. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. But we also need to be looking at nursing homes. We have mm -hmm. to be concerned about nursing homes, long care facilities, children's homes i know those are not businesses but they are in the private in the public sector sorry mm -hmm. and of course um the i know the government has been working with paho to look at guidance for workers there yes. but in the private sector there are a raft of things that they need to do they need to be looking at uh, businesses and divide them into low, medium and high risk businesses, mm -hmm. depending on the extent, the level of personal interaction that previously existed as with customer service businesses. Yeah. Yeah. And once they put them into those low, medium and high risk categories, then ensure that they take steps to both um, raise the level of awareness, or if I put in brackets, educate their workers about the, the dangers of COVID-19 to certainly put things in place, whether it be screens, barriers, and mm -hmm. so on, depending on the type of business it is, to mm -hmm. ensure that their workers are protected, but mm -hmm. also the public is protected. Mm -hmm. If there are businesses like the food retail businesses, that have been uh, opening up. If you're selling things, um, to, the workers need to uh, ensure that they cover their mouths and, and noses, mm -hmm. that they observe all the proper hand hygiene, so, and that the businesses are sanitized regularly. Um, we, we haven't also mentioned previously, but yeah. I know we worked with the Chambers of Commerce to talk about ensuring that you have proper hand sanitizing, but a place for any employees in that business where if they were to become ill or show any signs of flu, 
that they could be uh, put in, in a room where and then medical help sort or someone can come for them. So we have to think proactively now. Yes. This is not life as usual. Um, we will be talking to the business community again. We will be working with the Chambers of Commerce to continue supporting them on what measures they need to be taking. But they really need to start by dividing their businesses into the low, medium, and high-risk categories. Dr. And Wheeler, then we in terms of, them. let me jump in. In terms of low, medium, and high-risk, so in some countries, um, you have the opening up of barber shops and hair salons and mechanic shops, yeah? But yes. what level of risk is there with, the, with this category of, work, of, of service uh, companies? Well, because they are personal services, and of course, with barber shops and so on, you touch, you are touching your customer if you are a barber, um, and you are normally in close proximity, you can't cut someone's hair from six feet away. Mm -hmm. So um, there would need to be particular measures in terms of what does that barber wear? What does the customer wear? How does the, both the barber protect himself or, or herself? Mm -hmm. It's usually himself, but protect themselves. Uh, and also what do they put in place? So for example, you may have seen barbers wearing face shields mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. i've seen and that yes. the issue of wearing disposable gloves now it is not good practice to wear gloves just like in a hospital where you go from one customer to another with the same gloves so th we need to be thinking of all of the things a barber needs to do or a hairdresser or any service where they come into close contact with someone else but yeah. right now those um those businesses have not yet opened yeah. as far as i'm aware yes you know it's a balancing act isn't it in all countries around the world because uh, most uh, several economies are fueled by the sme sector and yes. uh, this is the sector that has um some of the companies that have close contact and therefore aren't able to open and, and they're perhaps more vulnerable than the larger companies that are able to open. So it is really a balancing act between uh, uh, managing the economy and managing the health of the country. Yes, it is. And um, the, the issue of um, lives and livelihoods will be with us for some time. It is inevitable that once you start opening up and trying to improve people's livelihoods to make sure they can earn an income, that there is going to be some risk. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to um, the steps that I just mentioned, they, they would need to spend money on sanitizing their properties, for example. So it is true. Uh, we do have to keep balancing this. But you know, throughout all of it, even if economies reopen completely or largely, and they don't pay attention or ongoing attention to the public health measures, especially um, with the personal hygiene and the keeping the environment clean, they will have to close again. The government will have to take measures. So mm -hmm. we have to get used to living differently. And I think we have to keep re-emphasizing this yeah. and re-emphasizing the need for community engagement and community support of these measures. Otherwise, we will all suffer. Well, Dr. Ryan, Dr. Dr. Ryan, let me get his correct name here from the WHO. Dr. Mike Ryan, Emergencies Director with the WHO, actually said a bit of what you were just saying, that perhaps the world will have to become accustomed to living with the coronavirus just as we've uh, come accustomed to living with HIV or measles for a long time. Yes, and that is true because we actually do not know now whether uh, once there is a vaccine, mm -hmm. how long that immunity may last. We have absolutely no idea. Mm -hmm. And if we look at the pattern of previous flu viruses, look at H1N1, for example, we have to get vaccinated every single year. It is always circulating in our population. Yeah. Viruses are always circulating. It is the nature of a virus to want to live 
to adapt and find ways of staying within a population. Mm -hmm. But what we don't know yet is um, whether it will be reoccurring once a year, whether it will come back twice a year, whether we'll have complete immunity once we have a vaccine, or whether we will, like H1N1, I said, and the flu, whether we will have to be vaccinated every year. And some people, as you know, die mm -hmm. from the flu, especially the elderly. Yeah. Um, children are also at risk. So yeah. as this uh, the pattern of disease of this virus unfolds, we will learn more and we will be able to keep uh, governments informed. All right. On that note, Dr. Erica Wheeler, we want to thank you, as usual, for joining us so readily. Paho, WHO country representative for Trinidad and Tobago and the Dutch Kingdom Islands. And we'll see you next week once again, if not before, on the morning show. Thank you so much, Dr. Wheeler. Thank you, Lisa. All right.